So, chapter 6, maybe. <laughs> uh, Kevin Kevin was telling me that if this is the way I, I keep score at golf. He's not playing with me. He's not letting me have the scorecard. So. <laughs> I wondered why I always beat Tiger Woods. I couldn't figure it out, but now I know why. Uh, chapter 6. Uh, we come to this place and remember he's ministering to this church. This church is a mess, uh, and the people in it are a mess. Reminds us of ourselves, doesn't it? Because uh, we were once a mess, and we're going to see that as we go through this chapter. Uh, but he raises questions to them now in this chapter, and remember he's ministering them to the church. It's a body of believers. Uh, uh, there's some in there, of course, that aren't saved, but the ones that are saved, he's ministering to them because they're going through things uh, they've never gone through before. They're dealing with issues they haven't dealt with before, and, and they need correction. Uh, and just so thankful that uh, they're willing to be corrected. And really, that is a challenge for all of us, isn't it? Uh, that as people come up to correct us, that we'd be able to be corrected. Uh in a right way, in love, but to be corrected in a way that would just bring honor and glory uh, to our Lord. So uh, he comes up with these uh, really six groups of questions. Uh, he's asked a bunch of questions. There, there's a lot more than six, but there's six groups. And the first three groups really deal with uh, to remember who you are in Christ, to remember what it is that's going on and who you are in the the second three groups that we're going to go through uh, is uh, to who you belong to. <laughs> and we need to know that, too, because if we know who we belong to, then we can correct the things uh, that are in our lives and we can allow him to change us and, and to be that force, that, that reckoning force in our lives that would just be able to minister to us because we know we need change. We know we're not perfect. Uh, and if you think you're perfect, you already need correction, so we need to go from there. Uh, but to be in that place where we could just let Jesus do what he wants to do. Uh, and, and that's so wonderful because he always does good to his people. He doesn't bring evil to their lives. He always brings good because God is good all the time and all the time God is good. And, and so if we trust that, if we believe that, then, Lord, the things that are in my life are there for my good. So help me to learn, help me to grow, and help me to stay steady in walking with you. So Paul starts out with his church, and he says, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? So he brings this question out, and then he's going to start the groups of questions that, that just show that, that they're not remembering who they belong to or who they are. Um, but this question, uh, certainly they're in a place the church is going through issues. Uh, we've already dealt with the guy who was sleeping with his mother-in-law, done all of that, gone through that, and here we are in this place now. The church is bringing lawsuits against each other. <laughs> Boy, wouldn't that be great. Uh, this side is the people who are the plaintiffs. These, this side is the, the, the ones who are the defendants. We're, we're just, what do you do in a church like that when it's the only church in town? <laughs> Boy, and you have to be neighbors with each other. And yet they're bringing lawsuits against each other. And we laugh at it and we think it's funny, but it happens in the church, and that's so sad. And Paul starts out, there's really nothing new under the sun, is there? Uh, it's still the same things. Things are still going on, and people are still mad with each other. And instead of dealing with it and letting the Lord deal with it, they take it to court. They take it to law. And instead of letting the Lord change their hearts, they want their rights. And I was reading one guy this week, and, and there was an issue in a church, uh, and he was bringing an issue up before the body uh, because that's what the Word says, and so he was doing it. And he said, I have my rights. And the guy that was mediating looked at him and said, you're right. You do have a right. You have a right to go to hell because of your sin. But God forgave you, and that's why he came. And he just broke and dropped the suit. <laughs> where's my heart, Lord? Do I think that I deserve something? Because Jesus was defrauded, he was defamed, he was looked down upon, and he did absolutely nothing wrong. And yet he took it because he wanted people to know who he was and why he came. And Lord, why am I here? 
Am I here to be looked down upon by somebody? And if that's the case, Lord, help me and give me the grace to do it so that I can stand right with you and not right before the people and not have my own rights, but let them have their rights. And that is hard to do because we all think that we're right, don't we? This is the way we do things. And I, I'm the only one that does it right because this is the way I do it. <laughs> and we can't be corrected. We can't be changed. <laughs> we had friends uh, long ago. <laughs> I, I keep bringing it up because it's just so funny to me. But uh, they were married, living together for a while in a house. Uh, and all of a sudden, her toothbrush disappeared from, from the, the holder. And it was in, in the cabinet. And he, Oh, I don't know. Something's going on. And so he just let it go uh, and come to find out months later, not just days or hours, but months later, the reason she had her toothbrush in the cabinet was because the cat was licking the toothbrush. And she never told him. (laughs) And he had to forgive her. (laughs) Why didn't you tell me? I thought you'd noticed. We don't know. But, Lord, where's my heart in this? I I have a right for you to tell me. I have this. I have that. But, but Lord, help me to have your heart. And, boy, sometimes that forgiveness, sometimes the hurts that we go through are a lot bigger than, than a licked toothbrush. But, Lord, am I willing to be in that place where I can let it go and just let you be God and be above us and bring us through this rightly? Uh, and not go to court with it. So the first group of questions starts out in verse 2, and he says, Do you not know, and and that's going to come up uh, about six times in this chapter, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? Uh, Remember who you are. You're going to be saints who are judging the world. Amazing. And, And saints aren't just people who are designated and have done miracles. Saints are believers in Jesus Christ. The Word tells us that. Everyone who believes in Jesus Christ is a saint. You can go around calling yourself Saint whoever. (laughs) But uh, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, uh, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? If you could judge the world, why can't you judge the things that are going on or discern? Uh, And we we know and we get those semantics that are there that uh, don't judge me. You know, the word says don't judge me. Uh, Only God can judge me. Uh, but we go through, and, and this really means discerning the things that are going on so that we can we can bring out the right result, to discern what's going on. It says this in, in Jude chapter 6, um, or Jude verse 6, thank you, I knew that. Uh, it says uh, that, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness under the judgment of the great day and we're going to be the ones that are there doing that we're going to be in that place it says this in second peter chapter 2 um, verses 4 and 9 uh, it says for if god spared not the angels that sinned but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment And then verse 9, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and reserve the unjust to the day of judgment to be punished. So there is going to become a judgment day. There is going to be a day of judgment. And it says that you saints are going to judge the world. Jesus is going to judge their resting place, their place of habitation. But we're going to be able to judge the angels. Can you imagine? We can't even see them. We know, we know about them from Scripture, how they appeared to others. Uh, one day, one angel destroyed 185,000 Syrians during the night. They must be big and strong. And we're going to judge them, but we're going to judge the ones who have fallen away from their first estate, it says. And not that we're going to judge them in, in that sense of, of pronouncing judgment, but just looking at them and realizing the judgment that's already come upon them because they've fallen from their first estate already. We get just get to be part of what God is doing. And boy, that, that seems harsh to us in a sense, but the Lord is just, the Lord is perfect, the Lord is right in all his ways. And if we trust him, 
then we go forward with this just looking to him because he has the way for us. And in heaven, we're going to have those perfect minds, the perfect hearts, the perfect ways that are going to be able to do those things rightly and to realize the reasons behind those things. And wouldn't it be great now if we could discern those things that are right and true because we have the Lord's heart and we're not judging on the outward appearance. We're judging because this is what the Lord has showed us. Oh, sometimes it, it's hard, but we need to remember who we are. Are we God's kids? And remember, he's speaking to the church that's in a mess, and we all can be in that place sometimes of being in a mess. And I tell you, it, it's hard to be corrected, especially for spouses. The hardest thing for husbands to say is, I'm sorry, I was wrong. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, but as we come to that place of just realizing, God, you want to correct me, you want to help me, minister to me, and show me, Lord. And you know what? If we can't be corrected, then are we really growing? And if a brother or a sister brings correction, brings that that place to us of showing us, and if we don't want to receive it, uh, do we really want to be corrected, or do we just want to be right? Can we really examine ourselves and say, is it true? Is that what I am? Or can I go on from here and grow? Uh, and so he looks at the church and, and he says, uh, if you're going to judge the world and the world's going to be judged by you, can't you judge the smallest matters in the church, the matters of heart that are in the church? Mm. Know ye not. Uh, and so the, the, the second here, know ye not uh, that we shall judge angels. How much more <laughs> uh, uh, things that pertain to this life. So if we can judge the world, we can judge angels. How is it that, that we can't judge the smallest matters in the church? If then you shall have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. He says, take the least esteemed in the church and let them judge. If they have the Holy Spirit, if they're born again, then they can judge the smallest matters that are in the church. And it's amazing what Paul brings to them in just showing them that the newest of believers can discern that things are right, things are wrong, and that you should listen to some things and not listen to other things. And isn't it amazing that when you first got saved, if you remember... If you can remember, <laughs> we have minds that are losing more than we knew. But if you can remember, the, the Lord gives you discernment to, on those things to listen to. And you listen to some of the things and you go, I don't know, that just doesn't sound right. That's just the Holy Spirit speaking to us to show us those aren't the things that you should be listening to. And then we get deeper in the Word and we see why, because He shows us and He, and he leads us in those places. But He says this in, in Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 39, he says, But I say unto you that you uh, resist um, not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn him to the other also. And if any man sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And how many of us would be willing to do that? If somebody would take us to court and, and sue us for everything we have and we say, Well, I like your shirt too. Okay, <laughs> have my shirt too, instead of demanding our rights. Oh, and yet what did Jesus do? He didn't protest, didn't open his mouth, led like a lamb to the slaughter. And he could have. He could have called down 12 legions of angels and defended him. He could have spoken, just like he did to the soldiers that first came to him in the garden. And he says, who is it that you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. And it knocked them all down. He could have just spoken a word, and yet he didn't. He humbled himself to the work that was before him. In verse 41 it says, And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. <laughs> uh, give him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not, not thou away. And he goes through and just gives us these instructions of, of things to, to go through just to check our hearts. And it isn't going to be every case because sometimes the Lord will say no. But that's why it's so important for us to depend on the Holy Spirit, his work in our hearts and our lives to know what it is that, that he would want us to do. 
because he has different ways for different people. Sometimes he wants us to, to give and to give completely, and other times he wants us to, to hold, hold back because he knows what's good for the person that we're ministering to. But we need to be in communion with the Holy Spirit so that we know what it is that the Lord is doing. Sometimes we hinder the work of the Holy Spirit because we, we think, oh, this is from the Lord. i got to do this, and yet we're hindering the work that God wants to do. We, you learn that early on in the church, that a lot of people come into the church just to get money. And then you go, oh. And then you go the opposite extreme, I'm not giving anybody money. <laughs> but in the midst of it, the Lord has, has different times and different places for each person. Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no. But it's always God's work. And, and we can't remember one guy, a uh, pastor in, in uh, Cornerstone, uh, who's got a huge church in, in Virginia. Uh, and the Lord told him one day uh, that he wasn't always to pray with the people that came up after service and wanted to pray with him. And he couldn't believe it was the Lord, and the Lord confirmed it to him. And so wouldn't you know, the next Sunday he's teaching at church, Lady comes up afterwards and says, I want, I want to pray with you for my husband. And the Lord says, no. And, and he goes, I can't. <laughs> and she goes, what do you mean you can't? He said, I can't pray with you. And he walked away. And she stormed out of the church, went home mad. Her husband was there because he didn't come to church. He said, what's the matter with you? Husbands know these that work. We got clues. <laughs> when our wives are mad, we got clues. Yeah, we know what's going on. Uh, maybe. <laughs> but he says, what, what is the matter? And she goes, the pastor wouldn't pray with me. He was a man who didn't go to church, who didn't believe, who didn't want to go to church. And he looks at her and he says, I'll pray with you. And it blew her away. And so he prayed with her. Then he started reading the Bible and they started going to church together. She didn't go back to Cornerstone. So months later, she went back and, and went up to the pastor and said, I just, I just want to thank you. And he goes, for what? Because <laughs> you wouldn't pray with me one day. And he goes, yeah, I remember that. And she goes, but I went home and my husband prayed with me. And if you had prayed with me, he never would have because I wouldn't have asked him. And I wouldn't have gone home mad. And he wouldn't have seen that I was upset, and he would never be in church now. Sometimes the Lord does things, and we are just blown away by what it is, and we don't understand. But God has a perfect way of working these things out. We may not see the answer, but we need to follow what the Lord is saying, because that's a place of blessing. There's blessing in obedience. And certainly for the church here, there's a blessing in obedience to do the right things, to change to listen to what the Lord is saying and to do those things. So know ye not that we're going to judge angels, and if you then have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church, even the least of those who are, have been saved, know what's right and what's wrong in, in the church. And he said, I speak to your shame. Uh, as he looks at the church and brings correction to the church, can you imagine these guys? <laughs> We'll never invite that guy back to teach here again. <laughs> oh, I speak to your shame. It, 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 is it so that, that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. Not just based on friendship, but based on truth. And that's where we always have to go. Not based on friendship, not because I want to please you, but because I want to please my Lord. But brother goeth to law with brother. And that before the unbelievers. You're taking this to unbelievers. You're taking this to a place of judgment in the church uh, that, that, that shouldn't be. Uh, and you're taking people in the church to it. It says this in Proverbs 18, verse 19. He says, A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. Hard to break through once you offend a brother. But if you do it in truth... In love, it can break down those bars. It can open those doors. Because it was love that opened the prison doors with Paul and Silas. It's love that, that breaks down harshness and hurt in our hearts from things that have happened in the church. And all of us have been offended in the church and hurt, I am sure. And if I haven't hurt you yet, hang on, I'll get to you. 
uh, don't stand in line, but I'll, I'll find you. I'll know. I'll, I'll do it. Not because I want to, sometimes oblivious, sometimes just whatever, but I'm going to. But can you stand in the truth and let love heal the hurt? And he's asking the church to do that. He's asking the church, the people that are bringing lawsuits against each other, to let those walls be broken down and let peace rule and reign because love is there. And he's asking the church now, can we do that now? Can we do it here? Oh, boy. Pastor Joe uh, saying that when October 7th happened and and he's been over there 30-some times to Israel uh, doing conferences, uh, but he said the first time he went over to Gaza and did a conference there, He's sitting there in the church realizing that there was Arabs from Gaza and Jews in the same church. And they loved each other because the Lord had loved them to a place where they could love each other in spite of who they were. And we have churches that won't let people in because of their color, because of their financial condition, because of their heritage. Yet God wants to break those things down because his church is bigger than color. His church is bigger than than financial gain. His church is bigger than heritage because of his love. And he's looking at the church, and he goes, you're in trouble because the love is lost. The love is not there. Can we love each other enough to love the least in the church or to love the, the biggest and the best? It says, but brother goeth to law with brother, and that before unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, Because you go to law with one another, why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Because then that's going to make them feel good and I'm going to feel awful. (laughs) We're going to feel awful because of our pride. We're not going to feel awful for any other reason. It's just going to be pride. My pride won't let me. Oh, And he says, nay, you do wrong. That's out and out wrong and defraud and that your brethren by doing that and doing it wrongly we defraud our brethren from a blessing we defraud our brethren from growing in christ Mm. and that comes down to pride and sin in our lives and it doesn't even sound like sin doesn't it have an argument in the body and one wants to be right the other one wants to be right Well, who's right? And there's one that gives in and just lets it go. Because if he doesn't, it's going to enter into sin because what's going to happen? His heart is going to become hard against that brother, and he's not going to be able to sit in the same row as that brother that that, uh, held something against him. He'll go on another side of the church, and the other one will go on the other side, and they'll never get together again in the middle because they won't allow love to work. Oh. We got a long way to go, don't we? <laughs> Lord, my heart, my heart needs these challenges. So then he goes on, and then the third set of questions down in verse nine. He says, "Know ye not?" There it is again. Don't you know? How how is it that you don't know? How is it that you don't remember all these things that I, that I've told you? And remember, Paul ministered to this church, uh, spoke to them, and yet they were, uh, had gone and and come back into this place where they were doing things wrong again. He says, "Don't you know? Didn't Jesus say that too?" As the Pharisees would come up to him, these church leaders, and talk to him about things. Remember when they were talking to him about marriage uh, in heaven. And they said, if a man marries seven women, which one is, or if she marries seven husbands, which one is going to be her husband in heaven? Oh, my goodness. The questions we come up with, right? And these are church leaders. <laughs> they have no idea what love is. They just know what the law says. And Jesus says, don't you know and have you not read? And these are church leaders. And Jesus is saying to them, you never read this with your heart, did you? You read it with the law, but you never read it with the heart. You don't know the spirit of the law. He said, there is no marriage in heaven. Oh, then what are we arguing about this thing for? But they couldn't say that and they couldn't repent because of pride. Don't you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? So don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, that that passive form of that, nor abusers, the active form of that, 
of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Those that are habitually practicing those things. And that's the real meaning behind it because all of us are going to enter into sin one time or another in this life because we're in these natural bodies that still sin. But hopefully we're still not in a place of habitually sinning day after day in the same thing. Hopefully we're fighting it and we're letting the Lord have victory over it. The areas of the heart are are so deep. The hurts and the anger and the bitterness that we hold on to for, for years and years and years of not talking to each other because we have a hurt in our heart. Instead of letting love break that down, we hold on to it. And it just brings a callousness over the heart. And that's just as bad as idolaters and fornicators and thieves and being covetous. He says, let my love break those things down in your life so that you can love each and every one that's there. None of these people are going to inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. (laughs) Whoa. Whoa. But look at how he puts it. He puts it in in the past tense, such were some of you. You're not any longer because God has saved you. That isn't what defines you anymore. A thief doesn't define who you are anymore. You're not a thief anymore. You're supposed to be different. And we as born-again Christians, if you're born again tonight, we're supposed to be different. And not enter into that. Such were some of you, but now, and he has these three buts that are in here, but you are washed. You're washed in the water of the word. And you're sanctified. You're set apart in holiness because of what Jesus has done for you. You're no longer an enemy of God, but now you're, you're in the body of Christ. And you're his now, and you're sanctified. Not because you did anything, but because Jesus did everything. You're sanctified, but now you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. You're just as if you'd never sinned because he covers you in his blood and he remembers that sin no more. It's cast as far from him as the east is from the west. He's cast it into the depths of the sea. And the Father sees no more sin in you because of the blood of Jesus on you. Again, not because of what you've done, but because of what he's done. Aren't you glad you know Jesus? (laughs) Otherwise, we'd never have a chance. We'd still be in verse uh, 9 and 10. We wouldn't be in verse 11. (laughs) We'd still be in 9 and 10. We'd still be the drunkards and the, the idolaters and all those things. But because of what Jesus has done, you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified. And you almost have to look at the order, too. You can't be justified till you're sanctified, and you can't be sanctified till you're washed. There's an order in it, and the Holy Spirit brings it. You have to be washed. That's why faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You have to be washed in the water of the Word first before you can be set apart, before you realize that you're a sinner in need of salvation. And as you come to that, then He sets you apart, and then He presents you before the Father justified. No sin, because you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been set apart, and now you've been cleansed from all that's that's wrong and it's in the name of the lord jesus in his character in his nature and what he's done and by the spirit of our god the whole trinity is involved in your salvation and for some of us it probably takes all the trinity just to get us saved (laughs) we put him through a lot just to get us saved and so he goes on in verse 12 and he says but all things are lawful unto me but not all things are exp- or, but all things are not expedient uh, in, in that word in the greek is sumphero uh, which means to bear together bearing together and who's bearing it together with us not our brothers in the church not our sisters in the church so much but the lord is always with us if you're born again then jesus is in you And so he's bearing it together with you. Because remember, we enter into that yoke. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. We enter into that yoke with Jesus, that that two-harnessed yoke that we enter into. And Jesus is on one side and we're on the other. And he's with us. Paul says, I can do anything I want to. Everything is lawful for me to do. But some things 
just aren't being born together. I, I do not want to bring Jesus into a situation in my life that, that would make him ashamed because I love my Lord. I don't want to enter into adultery anymore because I don't want to bring Jesus into that situation. I don't want to be a thief anymore because I don't want to bring Jesus into that place where he's my accomplice. I don't want to bring Jesus into that. Lord, help me. Not all things are expedient. There's some things I don't don't do just because I don't need to anymore. I remember when I first got saved and, and everybody would come up to me, you going out with us tonight? You know, Thirsty Thursdays. I don't know if you know Thirsty's. It was a bar in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, and all the Wegman people on Thursday nights would go to Thirsty's. Quarter beers all night long. You can go through a lot of quarters. <laughs> it was awful. And you get saved. You going out with us? No. Why? Because now you're a Christian and you can't do those things? No. I don't have to do that anymore, and I don't want to do that anymore. And boy, that shuts a lot of people's mouths up because they don't know what to do with that. It's not that I can't. I don't want to. I don't want to bring Jesus into that place. I don't want to bring Jesus to that place of just bringing hurt to his name, to his character, to his nature. Lord, help me. And we have so many Christians that do so many things, and then people find out. Oh, you're a Christian, huh? And yet you did this? Well, I don't want your God. And the world tells us, I don't want to come to church because there's hypocrites there. <laughs> yeah, hello. <laughs> we are. We say one thing and then do another a lot of times. But you know what? Jesus is here. And that's why I come. I don't stay away because there's hypocrites in the church. Guess what? If there's hypocrites in the church, what's in the world? Yeah. <laughs> It doesn't get any better out there, but Jesus is here. That's where I want to be. So not all things are lawful for me, or all things are lawful for me, but not everything is is is, is quick to to please the Lord. I don't want to do those things because they don't please the Lord, so I don't go there. And he says, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. The, the power there is not the dunamis, uh, that, that Holy Spirit power that comes down, but this is excusio. Uh, it's just that, that place uh, of authority. I don't want anything to have authority over me that's not of the Lord. Because we only have one master, and his name is Jesus. You can't serve God and mammon too. The Lord said that in the Gospels. Either God is going to be your master or the world, the stuff of the world is going to be your master. Choose you this day who you're going to serve. What did Joshua say? As for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. That's my heart's desire. And it should be for you and I more and more and more that we want Jesus to rule and reign over our lives. Less and less I want the world to rule over me. Less and less I want money to to drive me. I want to be I want to be led by my Lord. I don't want to be driven by money. And then he goes on and he says, meats for the belly and belly for the meats. The belly is made for food, right? <laughs> and food is made to get into your belly. <laughs> That's just the way it is. But it says that God is going to destroy both it and them. Now, the body is not for fornication. He's just leading into something here. He's just giving this example. The body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. We are made for the Lord, and the Lord has been made for us. He's been made in the image of man. He's been made for us to draw us out of this dunghill of earth and bring us to heavenly places. He's come to save us from ourselves. I don't know about you, but I need saving. I need saving today just like I needed saving 20 years ago. I still need to be saved from myself because... I'm such a bozo, I'll enter back into dumb stuff. And God has both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. He has the power, and that's the dunamis, the power to raise us up, that Holy Spirit power that can raise us up. And that's why the church waits so much for the rapture. We see the signs all around us. We know the signs of the times. We know Jesus is coming soon. And we're just waiting for the rapture to happen. But while we're waiting for it to happen, what does he tell us to do? He says, occupy till I come. Be busy about my business till I come. 
and we witness in this world. <laughs> we had a, a waitress today, and I, I, I asked her how we could pray for her. Uh, and her first answer <laughs> was, uh, well, I want some good spirits. <laughs> I cringed right away. I said, well, there's only one good spirit. And she goes, oh, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> she knew enough what to say. <laughs> But isn't it amazing? We, we want God and the good things of the world. And we don't get both. God, you need to rule and reign over me. And Lord, may it be your spirit and not the spirit of this world. Oh, oh boy. Uh, so, so he goes on and he says, No, you're not that, that your bodies are the members uh, of Christ. Shall I then take the members uh, of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. He answers his own question. It's rhetorical. We, we know what the answer is. I mean, it's common sense. No, we, we can't do that. It's, it's not to be. We have no right to do that. We're, we're the Lord's and we're his and we should stay his. So uh, we look in, in verse 15. There is the fourth one as we start on the second set of questions. Remember who you are. Remember what you were made for. Your bodies are members of Christ. If you're born again, then you're the body of Christ and he's the head. And so he says, don't you know, don't you remember, don't you understand whose you are, that you're the Lord's. You're not here to act like the world. You're here to be different. So don't associate yourselves with members of a harlot, don't, don't come into that place uh, of coming and, and being adulterous to your God. Oh, and as he ministers to the church, uh, just an amazing thing. And, and this certainly brings us to a place, Lord, am I doing anything in my life where, where I'm making an idol out of something in my life, where I'm committing spiritual adultery with something in this world that would cause you pain? And we really have to examine ourselves over and over and over, don't we? And you know what? Sometimes even ministry can be an idol. And it can cause great damage to people if they don't have God first and the ministry second. I am not here just to be a pastor. I'm here because I love Jesus and this is where he's put me. But if I turn those around and I'm here because I want to be a pastor and I want a paycheck and I want to do that stuff then I'm not doing it for the Lord anymore. I'm doing it for something else. And that's adultery for me. And are we doing anything in our lives that, w- that would cause that? Am I, am I, is my heart going to a place when I hear things, Lord, that, that just cause depravity to come into my mind? Lord, change me. Help me. Because I don't want to do that anymore. I want to be different. And the older we go in the Lord, the more we should be doing those things less and less. And as the Lord challenges us, and so then the, the, the fifth group of questions comes up in verse 16. And he says, what? <laughs> know ye not, there it is again, know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body, for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined, or the word is cleaved, unto the Lord is one spirit. That if we're joined to the Lord, then how can we join ourselves then to something that's causing adultery in our lives? And he uses the example of a harlot because they're in a town where adultery was commonplace. The Romans were there, and they had a wife for bearing children. They had mistresses for pleasure. They would just do whatever. And it was creeping into the church. And Paul was just there. You need to be pure and holy, no matter how ugly your place is. Moving to another town is not going to help you. Because you know what happens when you move to another town and you say, well, I'll, I'll be better if I move to another place. You know what? You're taking it with you because you're it. <laughs> We're the problem. Lord, my heart's the problem. Changing churches isn't going to help me. Changing towns isn't going to help me. I need my heart changed. And my heart can't be changed unless I put myself before you and just let the things of the world go. Because you know what? In heaven, those things are not going to matter a lick. You aren't going to care about those things in heaven. They aren't going to matter to you now. Ugh. So he says, flee fornication. 
<laughs> which is the common sense thing to do. Flee it. Get out of town. Get out of Dodge. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. So in that place, he's just sinning against his own place. And in Leviticus 18, verse 20, uh, it says this, Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. You're going to defile yourself. And that seems to be such a commonplace thing. I know back in the 60s and 50s and, and before that, of course, uh, it was unheard of that anybody would, would be caught doing anything. And yet we see it in Scripture, don't we? <laughs> A man going out with a woman that wasn't his wife. But now it's commonplace because we'll live together before we get married. Because we got to know if we're going to be compatible. We'll, we'll use any excuse to get ourselves into a place where we can do what we want to do. Do we need that piece of paper? Probably not. But you know what? What we need is God in the midst of it. God, you need to lead me in the right way. I need to do the right thing for the right purposes. And then he goes on with the last quest, group of questions here in, in chapter in verse 19 and 20. He says, what? <laughs> he says that a lot. <laughs> he must be blown away by what the church is doing over there in Corinth. Uh, know ye not? There he is again. Don't you know? They must be tired of this statement by now. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God. It was given to you by God. It was given to you for his glory, and you are not your own. Oh, what do you mean I'm not my own? That goes against my nature. Right, your old nature, not your new nature. <laughs> what did Bob Dylan say? Everybody's going to serve somebody. Who are you serving? Is it the risen Christ or is it the Antichrist? Because if you're not serving Jesus Christ, you're serving the spirit of Antichrist. Oof, that's hard statements. But we have to check, Lord, where am I? You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. Oh, Lord, help me not to go in those places where you would not go. Lord, help me not to say those things that you would not say. Lord, help those thoughts that are not your thoughts be driven from my mind because I want you and I don't want me anymore. We've already seen what me can do to ourselves, but we've also seen what Jesus can do to us and for us and with us. He can change us. And he says this in, in verse 20. He says, for you are bought with a price. Hmm. What a huge price it was that he paid. God came down from heaven and gave himself on the cross for you and I. His body was broken, his blood was poured out, and he bought us. He paid the price for our sin. Therefore, because of that, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Come into obedience with who God is and what he has for us and what we are. Isn't it amazing? We are the Lord's both by creation and by redemption. He created us and he redeems us. He's done everything for us. I was reading uh, Tozer's sermons yesterday, and he says, there's only one way you come into this world, and it's by birth. You can't get into this world any other way except by being birthed. Isn't it strange that we have to be born again to get into heaven? <laughs> These two births that we have, physically and then spiritually, and that's for eternity. This life is temporal. It passes so quickly. The Gallatins saw that this week. Diane has seen it. Others of you have seen it. Frank has seen it. These lives are not forever. We're going home. And we don't know if it's tomorrow. We could go home naturally tonight. We don't know. And right now in America, there's so many sleeper cells that are available to the enemy to work for. We don't know if we have tomorrow. Mm. But what we do have is an eternity with Jesus if we know who he is. But it's not just knowing him. Are we being challenged and changed every day, or are we staying the same? Well, I can stay in this place. I'm saved. I'm not going to go to hell now. I don't have to change. I don't have to do anything different. I can go to church once in a while. I can read my Bible once in a while. I don't have to do anything else. But if we're not progressing, then we're falling behind the Lord in what he has for us. Not because... He says, if you don't go this far, then you can't get to heaven. 
It's that we miss out on the blessing of walking with Jesus. When when we went to Israel, you know, it's just such a sweet thing. If you ever get a chance to go, go. <laughs> it's wonderful. Uh, but to walk in the places probably where Jesus was, or at least somewhere in the vicinity, is just amazing to me. When I got off the plane, it was just like I was home. It was wonderful. I would go back in a heartbeat if I could. But instead, you got me. So, <laughs> uh, but but he paid so much of a price for you and I. What are we willing to give back to him? Are we willing, like it says in, in Romans 12, to be those living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God? It's our reasonable service. Or do we just want to be saved from hell? And that's as far as we want to go. And Jesus will let you stay there. But you're going to miss out on the blessing of walking with him, of seeing him work in your life, of seeing him work in other people's lives around you because of your witness, you're going to miss out on all that. And is this life really worth it to stay away from him and to stay close to the world? I'd rather be walking with Jesus. And he's willing to go to great extremes to find you. After he rose from the dead, he, he went to two men who were walking away from Jerusalem. <laughs> and he grabbed a hold of them. Where are you guys going? We're leaving. <laughs> Jesus died, and by the time he revealed himself to them and disappeared, they ran back to where they were supposed to be. They ran back to Jerusalem, seven miles in the dark, because they knew where they were supposed to be. And that should be for you and I. Lord, I want to be with you so much that I'll run back to the place where, where I'm supposed to be. And if we've drifted, if we've gone, if we've hardened our hearts in any way, Lord, forgive us and help us. But, Lord, help us to go back to that place where we're supposed to be so that we might be yours. Oh, he's so good to us. He loves us. And if you don't know it, Jesus loves you. And if you don't know it, he still loves you. And if you think you've done something wrong enough where he can't love you, he still loves you. Because he's the only one that died on the cross and rose again for you. Your friends didn't do it. Your spouse didn't do it. Your kids aren't going to do it. Jesus did. So, Father, help our hearts, Lord. <clears throat> just to be in that place where we would want you more than anything else. Uh, minister to us, Lord. Show us the truth of where we are. And we know it's not just about lawsuits and, and those things that, that were there. It's about the heart condition, Lord, that you're trying to reach. You tried to reach them at Corinth, and you used those, those terms that were there because that's what they were involved in. But all the time, you just wanted their hearts. You just wanted them holy and, and separate and to know that they were washed and cleansed and purified, and that you dwell in them and with them. And you want us to know that, Lord. So, Father, help us to know it, and to know it by believing it and acting it as we walk through this world, as we wait for you to return for us, Lord. We love you, we thank you, and we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.